Soon after, we were shooting a longer interview with Shruti Jitrai on 25 years of rich filmmaking. This was the first time he agreed to give a long interview to the Duradarshan in India. And as usual, as with all his work in cinema, he was so concerned about it that the producer, Devash Chakraborty, and I spent long hours, about three long sessions with him, discussing the nitty-gritty of the program, every little detail, every little element that he and we wanted to bring into the interview. involvement in every separate aspect of the making of a film has been a slow and gradual thing. When you started, you were not working on all the aspects of the cinema. Why and how did you decide to take on every element of the film one by one? Well, actually, it's not every element, really, but most of the elements, I should think. Uh, in, the, in the early days, for instance, in the, at the time of uh, the trilogy and Opusnok, I was doing uh, the screenplay. I was uh, directing, of course, and um, I used to get visual ideas for sets and things like that. I did my own casting because yes. I had very clear ideas of the kind of actors that I wanted for certain parts. I did my own casting and then uh, at the time of editing, I didn't operate the camera at that time and I didn't write the music. Uh, at the time of editing also, I was there, very much there. The films were more or less, uh, as the expression goes, cut in the camera. So there wasn't a great deal left for the editor to do, but of course I've had a very creative editor helping me. But later on, for instance, I took over operating. <coughs> uh, since when? Since uh, the time of Charulata. You see, I decided that the uh, camera, it was through the camera that one was able to judge uh, the action and the movement of the actors best, rather than sitting in a chair by the side. And uh, I found it helped the actors also because uh, uh, I was behind the camera, you know, they, they couldn't see me actually. Uh, and uh, it, it helped them, they felt easier. And in the early days I worked with, uh, on music I worked with professional I wouldn't say professional composers, but professional mus musicians. I mean, I worked with Ravi Shankar on uh, four of my films. But they were essentially instrumentalists. They were performers, concert performers. Uh, they were not trained film composers. So that, uh, they, for instance, they were not trained to write music which would run for two minutes and seven seconds and things like that, you see. So uh, it was always a problem working, although they were very inventive, Ravi Shankar in particular uh, devised some beautiful music for the trilogy and uh, I was very happy to use them. But the, the method that I used was that he, they would come, maybe just for a day or a couple of days, they would be, the rest of the time they were touring all over the world, if not all over India. And they would be available for, let us say, two days or three days, in which time they would probably have one look at the film. Not even the whole film, for instance, Ravi Shankar saw only half of Patit Manchali. And they would write certain specific pieces and the rest of the time, I was interested more in using their instruments 
I was interested in Ravi Shankar Sitar, I was interested in Ali Akbar Sarod, and interested in certain ragas which I knew would fit certain situations. So I had them perform maybe for three minutes, four minutes at a stretch, various ragas in various moods and various tempos. And later on it meant a tremendous lot of work in the cutting room for me, trying to fit the music uh, with the scenes. So finally, in uh, around 1960, at the time of Tinkonna, I decided to do my own music. the change or the variety of themes which have adopted later mm. been also a factor uh, in this choice that you have to rely on your own music. In the earlier films, for example, you had uh, more of a freedom, more of a going back into the romantic world of the village. And uh, later on you have been concerned with other forms and other sorts of experiences. Yes, that is true because more and more I felt that I needed, uh, for instance, when you are doing a theme which is uh, concerned with urban, uh, the contemporary urban yes. society, you can't uh, use conventional classical Indian music instruments like the sitar and sarod. They just don't, don't go with the theme. So I decided to use a combination of Western and Eastern uh, instruments. And uh, my, I had always been interested in Western music, and uh, I was also familiar with the Western style of notation. So I decided, and since I was getting too many ideas of my own, and it's, always, it's not always very um, satisfactory to have to dictate great musicians like Vilayat Khan and Ali Akbar. So I, and it threatened our friendship on a personal level, so I decided to do it on my own. And now more and more I use uh, less and less music, I find, because I can use the uh, mixing facilities have improved and I can use a more creative soundtrack, whereby one can use actual sounds uh, almost as you use music to suggest moods and things like that. I would you give some instances, or maybe one instance of uh, what you call this creative use of sound in your recent works? Something that has well, satisfied for instance, you. Uh, uh, in a in a city story, you can if it you can use in a Calcutta story in John Oron, actually the city itself provided the the noise of traffic and uh, that sort of thing, and uh, it's provided the 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 sound the the, the mood building soundtrack, you know. In Oshani Shanket, which one could well have used folk music in abundance, but I prefer to use bird noises, I prefer to use the sound of dhenki, you know, right. that sort of thing, and I prefer to use um, wind noises and uh, extraneous, other extraneous. I used uh, one particular bird, the woodpecker, which I recorded. I was lucky to be able to record one. And it comes at a very crucial point uh, when uh, Moti dies. You know, at that point, when she's lying on the ground with her eyes, staring eyes, and hold the Moti? camera. 
for about five, six, Mati. seven seconds on that face, uh, oh, we can hear the woodpecker going, which is a very shrill, rather alarming kind of, rather eerie sort of sound. And uh, I thought, uh, I felt that use of music would sentimentalize the scene, so I decided to use this, which was also a realistic sound, as well as a kind of a stylization of sound. Also, mm. At a certain level. At one time, uh, your films were associated with actors that you had discovered and molded for your films. But you have actually dealt with all sorts of actors, with old professionals, veterans, newcomers, artists that you have discovered, children, even animals in certain cases. Well, actually, I uh, started using professionals fairly early on, if you remember, uh, because after Pater Marcelino Aparicito came uh, Porosh Pater and uh, you had Jal Chakar. Tulsi Chakraborty. So I had uh, used Chul Tulsi Chakraborty and I had used Chobi Biswas. Chobi Biswas was a very, very special case because he was really a very, very big professional actor at that time, probably the biggest character actor in, on the Bengali screen of that period. And I had uh, some problems in the early stages, like for instance in Jal Chakar, uh, in the portions which show uh, show him as a young man, he insisted on doing his own makeup. With reference to your proposal for further loan against the securities already pledged by you with us, the board of directors regret Devana. Again, now to the power has already exceeded the margin limit set forth under the banking rules. How? Oh. Being a newcomer, a comparative newcomer, and being new to Chobi Biswas, I, I couldn't do anything about it. So, uh, all that portion which shows him as a young man remains uh, a very theatrical sort of makeup that that stays uh, in the film as a blemish but uh, I got used to Chobi Babu very and he got used to me uh, in a very short time and when I made a sec made the second film with him Debbie he was uh, so cooperative and he so one uses uh, different methods with different actors one with professionals one with professionals who are competent Another method with professionals who are not so competent, where you handle them almost as uh, amateurs, that has happened too. And a third method with newcomers who are talented, and a fourth method with new newcomers who are not talented, whom I cast uh, for their face and uh, voice, perhaps, just for the, these two qualities uh, which uh, fit a certain character. And yet a fifth method, fifth and sixth methods, fifth with uh, gifted children and the sixth method with not so gifted children. So I have used all kinds and I still keep on using all these six methods uh, for my uh, actors. There are directors uh, who insist that they would not like to involve their actors in the making of the film in any way. They would give instructions, uh -huh. they would pass orders and it is for the actors to work out the things. Uh, well, do you follow any such rigid uh, If an actor uh, has a very, very large part, like for instance Oppo in the trilogy, or let us say uh, Pratidandi, the main actor, who is throughout there throughout the film, or with Chabu, but Chabu Babu in Jal Shagar, and in many of these films where, uh, the, the, which are dominated by one or two or three characters. I usually uh, 
it's there naturally given the script well beforehand so they have time to learn their lines and in addition to that if they show an interest in discussing the part with me uh, to find out the motivations to be more clear about how it should be played I'm perfectly willing to oblige them and I do that we have sessions with I have had sessions with various actors he gives me the script and after I read the script we sit together discuss a lot of details how to play this particular scene or what should be the makeup how I should use my voice in that in this particular film and this course of discussion continues for a long time and when he goes to the floor he again makes some corrections or further additions and alterations in his script for the final shooting script and when in the set he reads out the dialogues again and there exactly I know how to play that particular scene because in through his intonations through his rendering of the dialogues it is it becomes absolutely clear how he wants me to do it akbar bolo to amra doctor gupta kotha shunte eshechi janobata sampadoker kotha noy amra doctor gupta kotha shunte eshechi janobata sampadoker kotha noy amra doctor gupta kotha shunte eshechi janobata janobata sampadoker kotha noy amar dikhe tak ekbar dekhe kono dikhe onno dekhe Uh, when you work on your scripts do you have uh, similar dialogues with the authors when they are available i don't mean the dead authors on whom you work but well if uh, it has happened in uh, not many cases uh, because i started uh, with dead authors uh, and uh, the first living author that i uh, that was parashuram parashpatar and when i I pre- had prepared as treatment I went and saw him and told him what kind of little sort of inventions uh, inventions of my own that I was going to put into the film and he was terribly excited and very very happy and uh, with Tara Shankar it was a different experience because I told Tara Shankar Babu that I had uh, I would like to make a film of Jal Shagar he said all right I'll do the screenplay for you and I said well certainly uh, I would love you to you could be wonderful if you could do the treatment then he started doing a treatment and when he had finished about three chapters I found that he was writing an original story completely original story which had almost nothing to do with the short story so I said no Tarashan Kurba why I'm interested in your short story so let me do a treatment so that was that but I never had a chance to discuss with him after the film open what he thought of the film but then I've discussed the films with uh, with uh, projects with Narendra Nath Mitra for instance he entirely approved of um, uh, Mahanagar and uh, by and large Shankar has approved of his treatments uh, but I think an actor really would ideally prefer uh, a literal translations of their stories and uh, there I can sense that there is a certain uh, element of dissatisfaction in even in their approval I have noticed that but that's this doesn't apply to all the writers that I'm uh, thinking of for instance Shunil didn't like his version of uh, my version of Aurangzeb Ratri but he wholeheartedly approved of all the changes that I made in uh, the next film that I did uh, uh Pratidandi and uh, well this has been more or less the case uh, has your attitude uh attitude towards the actual uh, original works mm. been the same when you have been working with Rabindranath script or with Bibhuti Bhushan Banerjee script or with the more contemporary authors well it's not that one wants once makes changes because just for the fun of it or i mean it's it's one usually has a much more serious reason for it and i personally can't think of a single instance of even a classic which has been translated successfully uh into cinema uh, uh, as being totally unchanged from its original uh, form because a writer an author doesn't write for, uh, with the film medium in mind at all and i think certain changes are inevitable i had to make uh, certain uh, 
rather significant changes. For instance, at the end of Postmaster, the girl, Little Rothorn, falls at the feet of the Postmaster and uh, sort of says, beseeches with him not to go away, or at least take her with him. But I felt that um, it was a bit Victorian. It might sort of spill over on the screen. It might seem over-emotional or sentimental. So I, I had her suffer. I had her go through these pangs of, uh, you know, I mean, the, through, through the same emo emotion of suffering without actually having her fall at his feet. You know, those changes one has to make. Environments have played a very large and significant part in your films and in certain cases you have made the environments yourself, in other cases you have found out environments, chosen environments and worked there. Yeah. But all through you have paid a very great attention to the fact of the environment, the reality, the impact yeah. of the environment. Uh, how have you uh, actually tried to build your environments, gone out of your, uh, starting from a story, starting from a theme and making a choice of your environment. You have not been controlled or limited, I have noticed, uh, within any rigid law no. that you would work only in exteriors or only in the studio. No, for instance, when my, my there are certain things that are dictated by circumstances. For instance, when one makes a film about contemporary Calcutta, one would, one should ideally shoot on location in actual interiors. And this is, a, this is a something which happens in, uh, abroad all the time because nowadays, for instance, the new wave people, all the French uh, directors, they have practically stopped building sets. They all work on location in actual interiors, apartment interiors out in the streets, but the environment there is different. Here, shooting on location in a city, urban location, is, can be hell, absolutely. I have had this experience many, many times. But streets, we cannot build in the studio, so we have willy-nilly to shoot in the streets, no matter how many thousands of people uh, gather to watch and get in the way of your work. But interiors, I find, because in order to avoid the problem, uh, the, the problem of dubbing, of post-synchronizing the dialogue, which I always find is a very mechanical process, I prefer to build interiors in the studio because I think I have sufficiently imaginative and clever art directors who will be able to simulate reality. And I have a sufficiently intelligent and uh, uh, mature cameraman to simulate actual light, right lighting. Uh, available lighting. And uh, our interior studio interiors have fooled uh, many of the best foreign critics I have spoken to them. They can hardly ever make out which is, which is actual set or which is actual interior. So this has been the case and uh, this is, as I told you, this is dictated by circumstances. But if a film is laid entirely on location, like for instance Kanchenjunga, which was planned to be shot in Darjeeling, and entirely outdoors, taking into account the changes of weather that takes place in Darjeeling. And the whole story, I spent a few uh, a fortnight or so there and observed how the weather keeps changing there. And the whole story was planned to take into account of rising mists, mists disappearing, and the sun coming out, the clouds covering the sun, and the gradual uh, falling of light from four o'clock to six o'clock, which is the running time of the film. And so even the changes of moods and the changes of... Well, the, mood, related the changes of mood. Well, that's this was a very things. special type of film where the changes of mood uh, were dictated by the changes of actual atmospheric conditions. Good day, sir. Um. 
myself primarily as a storyteller, as a maker of fiction films. But I have uh, on occasions, on the occasions when I uh, made documentaries, they were on subjects which, which fascinated me, which really drew me, uh, which uh, inspired me, let us say. First, there was a film on Rabindranath for the centenary, and the film on Binod Bihari Mukherjee, who was my art teacher in Shantani Ketan. A remarkable man as well as a remarkable painter and um, a film on Bala Saraswati, which was a tribute to a great dancer. But I would like to make more short story films, there's no question of that, because we do have a very rich fund of uh, filmable short, short stories, stories which should not be expanded. Uh, you have worked on a wide, wide variety of themes, styles, genres, you have done children's films, mm. fantasy films, realistic films, films based in the 19th century or even an 18th century situation, mm. films right in the 70s, the entire range. Do you still think you have other themes, other genres that haunt you or excite you occasionally, things that you would like to do in the future? Yes, uh, there are a few things which haven't been done yet. For instance, I've always wanted to do an epic. I've been fascinated by the Mahabharata and I'm still fascinated by Mahabharata, but I don't think the whole of Mahabharata can be tackled. So perhaps a segment of an epic, a segment of Mahabharata I'd do using our tradition of stylization, perhaps using the Kathakali. I really haven't got a very clear notion of what I want to do, but I definitely do want to do an epic, a story which everybody knows from beforehand. That is something which I want to do. Something what are the segments that have... Uh... Well, one is, one, I think one can make a film on the dice game itself. No. Just the dice game can make uh, an entire film. The main problem with Mahabharata is the, the characters. I mean, one has, if one thinks of an Indian audience, then there's no problem, because everybody knows who Karno is and who Bhishwa is, etc. But uh, I'm afraid a film of this nature has to be planned for the world market. Mm. Uh, and there, the relationship of the characters will uh, create tremendous complicated problems. Do. Tremendous do. problem. Because unless you address a person as uncle, for instance, at least three times, he's not uncle. I mean, mm. this is one of the things, one of the things that one learns over the years. That, and perhaps I would lo do, like to do a folk tale at some point. Very much I'd like to do a f an authentic folk tale, not a uh, guppy guy but an authentic folktale, perhaps based on a moment Shingitika uh, ballad, in a very, very simple, very, very simple style with very, very f little dialogue, but using, again, uh, Bengali folk forms. I'll continue to make children's films from time to time, but I know, I have decided to do that. And perhaps an English language film involving Indians, because, you see, if you have uh, people of different provinces uh, getting together in a situation. English is the only lingo that they can use. And that kind of uh, English language film, where in the, the language itself would be used creatively, maybe one person will be very difficult, uh, we're, we're very sort of uh, unvocal because of his lack of command of the language. Another would be very fluent, another would use a certain strong Indian accent. That sort of a situation. I, it's still uh, very much at the back of my mind, but I don't know what 
So there are still a few. You had a, you had a plan to do a science fiction film. Have you yes, indeed. It? I was forgetting about that. That I would very much like to do. But again, again that is a question of resources, technical resources. Mm -hmm. Because now, uh, Kubrick's 2001 and a few other films made since then have set such a high standard. And have extended the horizons of science fiction to infinity. There's no actually. question of making that kind of a mm -hmm. science fiction film mm -hmm. here in Bengal. But the idea that I had uh, originally was more of a metaphysical sort of science fiction film does not, would not involving so much technical expertise and perfection. Perhaps I, oh, that, that is one thing I would love to do at some point. Some years passed by. There were dreams. There were hopes. There were plans at the end of that last interview. And in 1981, he had already completed his first film for the TV in India, his version of Prem Chand's Satkati. Already in our last interview, he had suggested that short stories were a special area where he found he could experiment. Recognize the short stories, the shortness of the short stories, and play about with it. That gives you greater scope to experiment. And he had discovered Premchand with Shatranj already. He was moving also into an area which he had not tackled earlier. But this was an area which was fascinating him more and more, as he explained in the short interview that preceded the first telecast of Satgati. A little more than a year back, Manikta, you told me that you seem to have exhausted the problems on which you would have liked to make films and you are not even finding stories which posed new problems, more vital problems. How did you hit upon Sadgati? Well, actually, <coughs> Durdarshan had asked me to do uh, first a series of short stories, then of course we decided that we can start with one and so I started looking for a short story in Hindi because since this was to be for All India um, screening, therefore uh, I decided on looking for a Hindi story. And naturally I started reading uh, Prem Chand. I knew uh, quite a number of Prem Chand stories. Uh, I had read them in translations before. But this time I found uh, a fairly large volume of short stories published by, I think it was part of the UNESCO translation scheme. And I got that book, I read the stories, and I found Sadgati Deliverance, which is called Deliverance in English, in that book. And it struck me as uh, a remarkably uh, fine story and very, very filmic story and dealing with a problem, which, uh, of course, I found fascinating. Had you chose, Manika, have to do more with the quality of the story, the cinematic uh, richness of the story, or with the reality, the things happening around us in India at the same time? Yes, but things both. Happen. I mean, one looks not just for a form or an effective structure, but also for, for, for a theme. I think one, uh, and this is a story which combined both extremely effectively. Uh, it's, when I say that it's a perfect story, of course I mean primarily that it's perfect for filming. I mean, it's very cinematic. But at the same time, I felt that it was dealing with a problem which, which uh, concerned me, which, which, uh, which, which I, I, was, I found uh, that I uh, was very, very interested in, and uh, uh, it was very it treated extremely effectively. And it also had um, to do with what was uh, happening now. Although it was a story which was written some, something like 50 years ago or 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, but it still uh, is uh, contemporary. Uh, did you have to make any change in your basic style of approach when making a film for the TV? Especially you're making a film for well, the TV. Well, uh, not really in the sense of... Uh, I mean, one has to think of the slot. For instance, uh, I was told that the story would uh, had better be around 50 minutes uh, long. 
And so I had to keep that in mind. There was no question of uh, treating it in a, in a very free fashion. I had to keep the length in mind all the time. And it just so happens that the story uh, falls within that, that slot very easily. And uh, even the first cut turned out to be about 50, 49, 48, 50 minutes long. So it's, uh, I was lucky from that point of view because it's a story that lends itself to that uh, kind of treatment. Um, did you have to make any changes in the story as such? Well, I would say that I made very, very little changes. I, I wrote maybe, I wrote in a, a scene uh, that was hinted at in the original uh, scene between uh, the Brahmin and a couple of chaps, also Brahmin, who come to him for advice. Um, uh, I think Prem Chand merely mentions that these, uh, the Brahmin was having a conversation with, with some people uh, in, the, in, the, in the veranda, but uh, I wanted a scene with dialogue, and that was entirely uh, written for the treatment, for the film. Otherwise, um, the story follows the original, the film follows the original very, very closely, remarkably closely. And when people talk of the effectiveness of the last scene where the Brahmin sprinkles holy water, etc., etc., that is precisely uh, described in exactly the same way in, in the original. And the dragging of the dead body and the death of, of, of Dukhi, uh, everything is there in the original. I have not really dealt with the rural theme properly yet. I mean, Sadgati marks a beginning, perhaps, uh, uh, of that level of society. And I would definitely like to do more. Shatudit Rai has been awarded the special Oscar, which he considers as a great recognition of his lifetime's work in cinema. Well, it has been an extraordinarily pleasant surprise. Uh, and I never expected to get it for one reason, because uh, not many of my films have been shown in the States. Uh, out of the 26 or 27 I've made, I think about a dozen have been shown. But in spite of that, they are giving me this award, which is a great honor for me. And I don't think there's anything more that a filmmaker covets than this particular award, which is the highest award that a filmmaker can get. I'm very happy.